Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. It was 6 o'clock Monday morning. I was backing my car out of our garage on my way to catch the 645 train to my job in Manhattan. We lived in the small suburban community of Nassau Shores on the south shore of Long Island, just outside New York City. I stopped in the driveway to make sure the garage door closed before I pulled away from the house. The one time I forgot to check was two weeks ago. I received a phone call at work from an incensed Lorraine accusing me of not caring about her. Anyone could have walked in and attacked or murdered her while I was gone. Of course, I knew she was right, and I explained I just forgot and would make sure I would not forget again. That calmed her down some, but she still went on and on about how careless I had been. Didn't I care about her at all? How stupid could I be? I tried to calm her down reminding her that I had not done it in the three years we lived in the house, and I would definitely make sure not to do it again. The last two weeks she seems to still be holding the mistake against me. Things have been decidedly cool at our house and for the life of me I could not figure out why she was still having these feelings toward me. My name is Jeff Carlson and my wife is Loren. I am 27 years old. I am 5 foot 8 inches tall. I have light brown hair that I wear long but not long enough to put in a ponytail and have a closely cropped beard. I run the foreign exchange desk at one of the largest commercial banks in the country. In effect, we take advantage of the constantly shifting values of currencies around the world. The basic idea is to buy a currency low and when the value increases to sell and make a profit. It's an occupation not for the faint of heart. In essence, we are gambling with the bank's money. It calls for a very refined sense of intuition and good timing. Buying too soon or too late or selling too soon or too late could cost the bank hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even millions. The reason I received two promotions in the last two years is that my intuition is very good. Somehow, I can see when to buy and sell. I don't understand how my mind does it. Just looking at the trends, I get a feeling it is right to buy or sell, and my guesses have been right most of the time. The few times I guessed wrong did not matter when the bank execs figured out how many millions of dollars I actually made for them over the last four years. Lorraine is also 27, although a few months older than me. She stands five foot six with jet black hair worn just below her shoulders. She has a round face with soft Italian features. With her olive Mediterranean skin, she is visually striking to look at. At least I think so. She works locally in Huntington, New York, a town situated on the north shore of Long Island approximately 25 minutes from our home. She works for a national medical insurance carrier. They are part of FEB. They provide medical insurance coverage to federal and state employees. Most of her job is in the office in Huntington, but sometimes they go to gatherings of many insurers and deal directly with employees to try to entice them to sign up during the open season. She has been there for two years now. Her direct supervisor is Jim Beckman. She has been working for him since she was hired. I have met him once or twice at company functions in the past two years. One was a Christmas party and the other a company picnic. He was bigger than me, at six foot two inches tall and every bit over 200 pounds. It is quite obvious he works out regularly. He never did anything, but I just did not like him. Something bothered me about him. It was my intuition acting up. There was something out of place, and it bothered me. But not that much to make me mention it to Loren. As I watched the garage door close, I turned my satellite radio to the country western music station. The songs there were a little darker, just the right thing to match my mood. They sang about real things, failed marriages, unrequited love, and cheating spouses. As I drove down the street, the first song was about some guy who loved his bar. Catchy tune, but I did not get it. I came to a red light and stopped the car when the second song came on. As I sat at the light, it seemed as my eyes were open for the first time in a long time. The singer sang about the same things that were going on in my marriage with Loren. The staring out the window, seemingly not being in the same room, little slights, and sex that was most unsatisfying. I did not realize it, but I was sitting at the light with my mouth hanging open listening to the song when the cars in back of me stated honking their horns. I looked up and saw the green light and started moving forward. I crossed the street pulling into a shopping center parking lot. I sat and listened to the rest of the song play, then started going to the train station. I must have been on autopilot as I do not remember driving there. I caught the earlier 6.30 train to Pennsylvania Station. As I sat on the train, I thought back to when I first met Loren. It was July right after my 16th birthday. I would be a junior in high school when school was back. I was mowing the front yard for my dad when a moving van pulled into the driveway of the Miller's house two doors down. Old man Miller had died last year. Mrs. Miller was a nice but frail woman. One of her children lived two towns over and wanted her to live with them. 
Consequently, the house was put up for sale. I watched as a new BMW followed close behind the moving van. At the time, I did not know their names, but Mr. Frank Schiavo got out the driver's side door and his wife Cheryl got out the passenger door. Emerging behind her from the rear seat was the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. Lorenz Schiavo was a few months older than me. Her hair was cut short, giving her a pixieish look. She wore tight denim short shorts and a halter top that showed her tan midriff. She looked over at me and gave me a smile. For me, it was love at first sight. A few days later, after the move was complete, I was casually walking down the street when I saw that Lorraine was sitting outside with her mom. I don't know where I got up the nerve to go over and introduce myself to them. Cheryl Schiavo was a beautiful woman in her own right. Lorraine was a miniature of her mom. Mrs. Schiavo was smart enough to know that I really didn't want to talk with her and went inside to get some iced tea for us to drink. After giving us the tea, she went back inside leaving us sitting on the stoop talking. I am sure that she listened into our conversation while we sat on the front step. We got along great, and for the rest of that summer I would hang with Lorraine every day. I filled her in on the school we would both attend in the fall. There was no hugging, kissing, or sex. To be quite frank, I was still a virgin and very shy. I was just happy to be in her company. July became August, and then school began. We were not in the same homeroom and were not in any of the same classes, but we did eat lunch together and ride the same bus home each day. After only a week at school, I found out that the school was holding a harvest dance in the middle of October. The next day was Saturday, and I saw Mrs. Schiavo and Lorraine come home from food shopping. I went down to their home to help bring in the groceries. After the last bag was brought and I asked Lorraine if she would accompany me to the dance. She glanced at her mom and said yes. Her mom smiled. I found out later she really liked me and thought I would be good for her daughter. As September slipped by into October, I began seeing less of Lorraine than before. She had made new friends with the cheerleaders. I knew she wanted to be a cheerleader from conversations we had during the summer, and she was doing this to get a spot on the squad. I did see her every day on the bus, and we always sat together and talked. Finally, the big day came. I was going to get to show off, my girl, to all the guys at school. I am sure none of them thought that a girl like Lorin would be with a nerd like me. My dad drove us to the school as I was still too young to get a license. As we entered the dance, I saw some guys from the football team look over at us and some of them smirked and laughed among themselves. I wondered what that was all about but decided to forget it and went to sit with my friends and have some fun. We had danced a few times and were sitting a few out when a slow song began playing. Before I could ask Lorraine to dance, Billy Barber, the star linebacker, was there with his hand out saying to Lorraine, Let's go, babe. It's time for everyone to know who you're really here with. Lorraine popped out her seat and walked away without a backward glance. I sat there with my mouth open. I looked around at my friends and asked, what just happened? My friend Jack said, it looks like you just got dumped. I looked at Lorraine and Billy and they were glued together as they danced to a slow number. Her hands were around his neck while his were around her waist. It became apparent this was not the first time they had danced together. I could feel the color rush to my face. I felt so ashamed. I'd been made to play the fool. When the dance ended, Billy and Lorraine walked over to the football team's tables. When they sat down, Billy had his arm wrapped possessively around her shoulders. Billy Barber was one of the biggest guys in school. I knew I could not best him in a physical confrontation. I could do nothing but sit in my seat. I looked at the football team, and they were all looking at me and laughing. Lorraine at least did not turn around and join them in making a mockery of me. I sat at the table for most of the night. I wanted to run out of there, but I would not give them the satisfaction. I did get treated to Billy coming over to me, placing his hand on my shoulder and whispering in my ear, you didn't think that a nerd like you could get a girl like that, did you? He looked at me and laughed derisively, then walked away shaking his head. Lorraine never did come back to the table or talk to me for the rest of the dance. I could see she was having a great time with her new friends. I wondered if she was laughing at me too. Finally, the dance was ending. I dreaded what I had to do next. I walked over to where Lorraine was sitting with Billy and his friends. Lorraine, my dad will be here soon, and I have to take you home. Billy responded, get lost, Carlson. She's going home with me. Lorraine, I snapped. I really don't care how you get home. If you don't go home with me, my dad will feel compelled to tell your mom that you left with someone else. You can explain to your mom why you came home with Billy. I turned and walked away. At that point, I didn't care if she walked home by herself. Soon, Lorraine sat down in the seat beside me. She tried to make some small talk asking, did you have a good time at the dance, Jeff? I looked at her with disgust and replied, Are you from another planet? You dumped me for that a-hole, Billy Barber. It was obviously planned. 
You don't say another word to me for the rest of the dance and you ask me that? So to answer your question, no, I did not have a good time tonight. Soon I saw my dad's car pull up in front of the school. I stood up and walked towards his car. My sudden movement surprised Lorraine, and she had to almost run to catch up to me. Dad's car had the windows open, as it was a cool and pleasant fall night. As we approached, he asked us, Did you guys enjoy the dance? I didn't respond and he got a funny look on his face. I think he could sense something was off. As we reached the car together, she waited by the rear passenger door for me to open it and for me to get in behind her. I had other plans. I opened the front passenger door, got in, and closed it leaving Loren to get in by herself. My dad was furious. He told me to get out and open the door for my date. I told him, I would if she was my date. I looked at my father and his look said what the hell is going on? As I sat in stony silence Loren opened the rear car door and got in. My dad shrugged and drove us home. Not a word was spoken. When we pulled up to the Schiavo's house, Lauren's mom was waiting at the door. My father got out of the car as did Lorraine, but I just sat there. Lauren's mom also could sense that something went wrong. She knew I would normally walk Lorraine to the door. As Lorraine walked past her mom, I turned to look at her. I could see her mom look at my dad with a quizzical look. She then looked at me. Lorraine turned to look back, and we caught each other's eyes. We tried to read each other's faces. I could not read Lauren's face at all. It was a blank page. If she could read mine, it must have been filled with disgust and anger. When Dad got back in the car, he asked me what happened. I just told him that she found somebody she liked better than me at the dance. I never told him about her deception. He told me forget her son. There are plenty of fish in the sea. After that we did not talk much. Sometimes I would walk past her house. She might wave or say, hi Jeff. I always ignored her. One time I went by while Mrs. Schiavo was out with Lorraine and they both said hi to me at the same time. I pointedly said, Hello, Mrs. Schiavo. Nice day, isn't it? I said not a word to Lorraine. It was if she did not exist to me anymore. Soon Lorraine stopped trying to talk to me. I would see her being picked up each morning by Billy Barber in his car with a bunch of other kids and being dropped off after school. She made the cheerleading team. I made the honor roll. After graduation, she went to work. I went to the Wharton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania on a full scholarship. My folks gave me a big graduation party. The Schiavos were invited as they had become close friends of my parents. Lorin was not invited. My folks wanted to, but I told them if she were invited, I would not show up for my own party. It was a surprise when Mrs. Schiavo sat next to me. She told me, I was so surprised when you returned home the night of that dance. I thought you two made a great couple. I am truly sorry that something happened between you that night. We made some small talk about the warden's school and then she finally blurted it out, what happened between the two of you that night. I looked directly into her eyes. It was like looking into Lauren's face, just the way she would be 20 years later. Older yet still young just as Lorraine would be with a soldering sexuality. I had never thought about her that way before and quickly put it out of my mind. Finally, I told her, we realized that we wanted certain things out of life. That night we discovered they were different things. I really wasn't prepared to tell more of Lauren's deceit. She looked like she wanted to say more but decided against it. She kissed me on the cheek, wished me luck and left. My new job with the bank started in mid-June. That gave me one month to find an apartment in New York City, something close to work, finally settling on a one-bedroom, one-bath unit in the Soho neighborhood off Hudson Square. It was a great location with everything within walking distance. There was no need for a car. My new job was hectic, learning all of the ins and outs of my new position. It had been taking up all of my time. There had been no time for socializing. I was quickly realizing that what you learned in school and what is needed in real-life situations is a totally different reality. It had been four months since I saw mom and dad. One evening mom called to ask me home for a weekend. She told me I could stay in my old room. It would be no problem since half of my clothes were still there anyway. Plus, I was missing mom's home-cooked meals. Taking the train was the easiest way to get to my parents' house. They lived only a short eight-block walk north of the train station. For blocks into my walk, a car pulled up next to me beeping its horn. A high school friend named Becca was hanging out the window yelling, Hey stranger, need a lift? Heck yeah. I yelled, It's hotter than hell out here. Hopping into the rear seat, I saw my old friend Jack behind the wheel. We sat parked on the side of the road and caught up on what had been going on in our lives the past four years. It was fun to be in the company of old friends. I didn't know that you guys were a couple. How long has this been going on? I queried. Becca reached her left hand out to show me her wedding band and engagement ring. You're married. I asked astonished. 
Two years now, Jack replied with a smile. I had no idea. I replied somewhat sadly. I haven't been a good friend these last four years, have I? That's crazy, replied Becca. We haven't gotten in touch with you either. It's just life. Thanks for that, Becca, was my relieved response. Man, it is really good seeing you guys again. With that, I could see an idea float up into Jack's mind. The kind of idea that should be given more serious thought, but he just blurted it out. If he had said nothing or given it more thought, I probably wouldn't be writing this story. What he said next changed my life. Hey, Jeff, we are having a party at our place tomorrow night. Would you like to come? Sitting in the back seat, I could see Becca turn to Jack and give him a look. It was a look men come to understand once they get married. It meant, are you crazy? Shut up. If I had understood the look, I would have declined the invitation. Since I'm just a guy, and not knowing the meaning of the look, I guess I made the wrong decision. Sure, that's great. I'd love to. Are any of our old high school friends going to be there? Becca turned and gave me a meaningful look and told me, yes, there should be quite a few. Great. I can't wait. I'll bring some beer. What time and where do you guys live now? Jack piped up, 7.30. We live at 135, Rimsom Street. Not too far from your folks. Jack put the car into gear and we continued the four short blocks to my parents' home. I got out of the car saying, see you tomorrow night. Visiting with my folks was nice, but I couldn't wait for Saturday night. Everybody must have changed in the last four years. I knew I had. It would be fun to see old friends and renew friendships. At the party, I was talking to Kenny Carter, whose father owned a fence company. He had gone into the family business and were we discussing how the company was holding up in the economic downturn when I felt a tap on my shoulder and heard, Hi neighbor, long time no see. Looking over my shoulder I saw her, Loren, and standing next to her a girl I didn't know. She was as beautiful and desirable as ever. Yet the visage of a sneering Billy Barber and Loren's back walking away from me was all I could think of. I turned my back to continue my talk with Kenny, but the other girl pulled me around by the shoulder and sneered, that was rude, dude. Not as rude as what she did to me. I snapped back. Jeff, please, you can't still be mad at me about that night. It's been six years, said Loren. I sure as hell can, I fumed, turning and walking away. From behind me, I heard Becca exclaim loudly. See, that's why. Becca ran off to comfort Loren and her friend while Jack pulled me to the outside deck. Jack told me I would have to make this right by Becca. He asked me to apologize to Loren. He pleaded with me, otherwise no nookie for him tonight. Friends don't let friends go without, so I sucked it up and went looking for Loren. I found the three in the kitchen. Would you two mind leaving? I want to talk to Loren alone. Loren's friend spat. No way, leave her alone, you bastard. Becca intervened saying, they are really old friends. Let them talk it out. Both girls left, leaving Loren and I alone. We spent a few awkward moments of silence when I decided to start the ball rolling. Loren. I want to apologize for saying what I said. I know you didn't expect it. What happened that night was so long ago. I have to tell you that my feelings and ego took a serious hit and it came from a place I would never have suspected. I put so much trust in you. Maybe it's time to put it all behind me. No, you're right, Jeff. I did something deceitful. I acted like a little shit, didn't I? I did deserve what you said tonight. I never apologized for what I did. Would you accept an apology from me now? Thank you. Loren and yes, I accept your apology. Loren leapt into my arms hugging me. We looked into each other's eyes and then we kissed. Not a sweet gentle kiss, but a demanding one with just the right amount of tongue. We continued our makeout session until Becca and Jack walked into the kitchen, with Becca remarking, I'll be damned honey, it looks like you did know what you were doing. Jack gave a sigh of relief then puffed out his chest saying, damn right, and don't you forget it. We all laughed and rejoined the party. Loren and I started to date and nine months afterward we were married. The conductor called out the next station, bringing me back to the present. As the train began to roll out of the station, I reviewed the last three months of my marriage in my mind. When I finally got off the train, I was sure of it. My wife was cheating on me, and our marriage. It seemed foolish to conclude that on the basis of a country western song, but everything fit. I was sure of it. Especially when the little voice that I normally found so comforting when it told me to buy this currency or sell that currency was now sounding alarm bells that I could not ignore. As I walked past Howard Goldman on the way to my office, he looked at me strangely. I sat down heavily in my chair with Howard hot on my heels. What's wrong with you this morning? He asked. Nothing, was my talkative response. Bullshit, was Howard's one-word answer. I get paid the big bucks to see that all my people are happy and content when they show up for work. 
I can tell by the state you are in that I will not let you gamble with the bank's money today. So, tell me what's up or go home. I sighed. Are you sure you want to get involved in this, Howard? He nodded in the affirmative. I looked at him and shook my head no. Then I blurted out, I think Lorraine is having an affair. Howard's face registered shock. Are you sure? Howard asked. I answered, truthfully, no I'm not. It is just a feeling I'm getting. Your feelings are usually right, he acknowledged. Therefore, you should not ignore them. What are you going to do? I'm not sure. I just found out today, I replied. Don't worry about anything. I will back you in whatever you decide. When you figure out what you want to do, let me know. My door is always open. I don't want you to spend too much of the bank's money today. I don't think you're on top of your game, insisted Howard. Of course, I knew he was right. I let my staff do most of the work that day and for the next two weeks after that. I think that they liked the freedom to work without my input. I guess I had too heavy a presence for them to feel comfortable when I was around. I got up, closed, and locked the door. As I sat down, tears started to well up in my eyes and run down my cheeks. Some man I was. Not even sure if anything was going on and already I was crying. I thought about a life without Lorraine. I loved the woman from the first time I laid eyes on her. I didn't think I could go on if I lost her. I put my head on my desk and closed my eyes, wallowing in my misery. I am not sure how long I stayed in that position, but somewhere along the way the pain turned into something else. I was no longer feeling pain, I was feeling anger. I thought about going home and confronting Loren. That would be really foolish, wouldn't it? What proof did I have? I had the lyrics to a country song. No, I would need to get proof. I would need to formulate a plan. I would make her pay. I would make whoever she was doing it with pay also. I wanted them to feel the same emotions I was feeling. They would feel the pain. I would make sure of it. I needed to make a plan. And soon. The first thing I did when I left work was purchase some voice-activated digital recorders and place them in unobtrusive areas around the house. I placed them in bedrooms, bathrooms, the garage, places where she might talk to someone while not on the phone. Then I attached a recorder on the telephones. I figured that was all I would need to catch her. Just be vigilant and she would show her hand sooner or later. I tried to act normal around Loren, but I guess I didn't do a very good job. I had installed the recorders on Wednesday, and by Friday, I had the first proof of Lauren's betrayal. Friday's incriminating conversation went like this. Jim, this is Loren. Why are you calling me at home? What if my wife answered the phone? Jim Beckman barked. Don't worry. I would have made up a work excuse. I think we should back off a bit. Jeff is acting funny. Has he accused you of anything? No, he is not acting normally. He seems cold and distant. Maybe we should just cool it for a while. Okay, if you think that's best, fumed Jim. Then he had an idea. Loren, you know I am taking a trip to Miami in two weeks. Why don't I try to talk Fred into sending you with me? Then we could spend a week together. What do you think? He asked. I don't know. He might not go for that even if he weren't acting funny. The way he is acting might make him. Well, I don't know. I don't want to make him suspicious. I could ask him and see what he does. If he acts weird, I will be able to decide if he knows anything. Let me run it by Fred, and if he goes for it, then you can tell Jeff it is a work trip, laughed Jim happily. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye. So, now I knew for sure. Before this, it was just lyrics on a song. Now it was for real. Loren was cheating on me. She is planning to go away for a week of sex with that a-hole Beckwith. As the realization hit, a heavy sadness came over me. I was sad for Loren. I was sad for our marriage. Slowly the sadness turned to pain. That witch. How could she do this to us? How could she do it to me? Again, my pain morphed to anger. If she was cheating, I would get proof and divorce her skanky ass. I would need a plan, and I didn't have one yet. I arrived home from work at my usual time of 7.30 p.m. The trading had been unusually hectic. Tomorrow at the market opening would tell how good I was at my job. There were millions of dollars on the line, and my mind was not where it should be. My wife was cooking dinner. How was your day? She asked, giving me a kiss on the mouth. She was acting like she was happy to see me. This was something that had not happened often in the past few months. I was waiting for Lorraine to come to me with her adulterous lie about her business trip to Miami. Monday and Tuesday I was expecting it, yet it did not come. I had spent long hours outside working on the yard or working on our cars. Anything other than spend time with my wife. I was afraid I would blurt out my knowledge of her cheating. I knew tonight would be the night. I hoped I would be able to pull off my own deception. It was a tough day. I am glad to see you're in a good mood, I replied. I am happy, and I hope you will be too after I tell you my good news. My day wasn't that great. 
You go first, I said. Okay, Lorraine giggled. I've been asked to go to South Beach to attend a seminar for the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program. It's an all-expenses-paid stay at the Victor Hotel, one of the old Art Deco hotels on Ocean Avenue. In the heart of South Beach, she crowed again. The bad part is I will be gone from Friday this week to Saturday next week. I'll be gone for nine days, honey. Do you mind if I go? She looked right into my eyes. Her head was cocked slightly, trying to see if I had caught on to her deception, or if I only would be mad that she would be gone so long. As I looked back into her eyes, I can see that they were alive with excitement yet. Somewhere in there, a tinge of sadness crept through. Nine days is a long time, honey. Do you have to go? Is this something that will be held against you if you don't? I inquired. I don't know, Jeff. It might be. I know that Mr. Beckman is depending on me to help out at this seminar. It will be a feather in my cap if I do go, she added. I walked to the front door and looked out at the front lawn. I knew if I said yes, our marriage would be over. If I said no, it would still be over. In the previous four days, I had made a plan, and now I made the decision. I quietly whispered, if this is important to you, or to your job, of course you can go. When will you be leaving? I asked. I couldn't hear you? Did you say I could go? She asked in disbelief. I could not say the words, as I knew my voice would crack. I just nodded my head yes. Lorraine ran to me and gave me a big hug saying, thank you. Thank you. This means so much to me. I promise you won't regret this. I already did. Lorraine would be leaving Friday from JFK Airport at 10.30 in the morning. I told Lauren, I'll take time off from work to drive you to the airport. Lorraine looked surprised and suggested, you don't have to take time off, honey. Mr. Beckman volunteered to take me. No way. You are leaving me for nine days and I want to be there to see you off. What could she say? I'm sure she would rather have gone with Mr. A. Hole Beckman, but how would that look to her unwitting cuck husband? I wondered. Her momentary look of disappointment was quickly replaced with a smile as she sang happily, That's great, honey. I would love for you to take me. What a great liar she was. I knew I upset the lover's plan just a little bit and felt a small amount of satisfaction. She only let her guard down for a second, letting her disappointment show. If I weren't so aware, I am sure I would have missed it. Thursday morning found me flopping into the big chair in Howard's office saying, It's this weekend. Lorraine is going on a business trip to Miami. South Beach no less. They are leaving Friday morning and returning next Saturday. Howard had fire in his eyes as he informed me. Whatever you want to do, you're covered. I spoke with Mr. Diamond yesterday about your situation and he gave you carte blanche on the company credit card. You will have to reimburse the bank for any non-business expenses within two weeks of your return. When I asked Howard how I could thank Mr. Diamond, he laughed. A good single malt scotch whiskey will be payment enough. You probably don't know this, but he got screwed badly in his divorce last year. He hates cheating wives. I shook my head in disgust. I knew he had gotten divorced. I did not know why. Now I knew. Howard, I need the next two weeks off. I need to get proof of her infidelity. Take as much time as you need. Within reason, of course. I will watch over your crew and make sure they don't screw up too much. Somehow, I am hoping this is all a mistake. Lorin is a great girl. I still can't believe it, Howard confided. I am having a hard time believing it as well, I thought. I took the rest of the day off to make some purchases. Before I left, I went online and purchased a round-trip ticket to Miami International Airport on JetBlue Airways. I stopped at City Camera and purchased the top-of-the-line Canon digital camera. It will take crystal-clear photos and video with audio. It came with a removable optical zoom lens. The salesman said I would be able to see an eagle's ass at 100 yards. Next, I purchased a small carry-on bag. Then a trip to Walmart for some new clothes, shorts, tops, underwear, sneakers, and sandals. The last item was a New York Yankees ball cap. As a diehard Mets fan, Lorraine would never believe I would wear a Yankees cap. The tops all had patriotic sayings, flags, and eagles on them. I didn't normally wear that type of shirt. The last stop was the drugstore where I picked up some new razors and a box of black hair dye. I was now prepared for my trip. I stowed the new luggage in the trunk of my car. All the purchases were on the company card. If Lorraine looked at our bank account, she would be none the wiser. I was ready. Let the games begin. At home that night, I asked Lorraine for her trip itinerary. She would be leaving on the 10.30 morning flight from JFK on JetBlue Airlines, staying in room 314 in the Victor Hotel. Mr. Beckman would be staying in a different room, I was told. Of course he was. I would be on the 1.30 flight leaving for Miami, three hours behind her. I was also able to get a room at the Victor as well. I would be in room 541. I was hoping I wouldn't get caught checking in. 
We were up early Friday morning as we wanted to get to the airport by 8.30 so Lorin would not have any trouble making it through security. The conversation was quiet on the ride into JFK. She tried to make conversation but I was not very talkative. The realization that I was driving my wife to the airport to have an affair was having an effect on me. Her actions were breaking my heart and I was very resentful, having trouble hiding my emotions. Jeff, are you upset? Are you alright with me taking this trip? You said it was okay for me to go. I know what I said, Lorin, but the reality of you being gone for nine days is just hitting me. I know you have to go. I don't want to be away from you for so long. I will miss you so much. It already hurts knowing you are leaving. I know you can understand that, I answered. Lorin replied, Of course I understand that. I feel the same way. It will be a long and lonely nine days away from you. Maybe so, but I will be rattling around alone in our home while you will be in a glamorous South Beach hotel vacationing with the stars, I groaned. Loren laughed. Is that what's bothering you? This trip will be mostly work, not too much vacationing, that's for sure. I looked at her and smiled sadly. I knew she was lying. We made small talk after that and soon pulled into the short-term parking lot. We made our way to the JetBlue curbside check-in, checked her bags and picked up Loren's boarding pass. We walked to the roped-off security area and saw Beckman waiting for Loren. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Loren give a quick glance to see my reaction to him. Beckman had the balls to approach us, give Loren a quick kiss on the cheek, and then offer me his hand. All I wanted to do was deck this guy, but I worked hard to appear unsuspecting and friendly. I actually smiled as we shook hands. I knew I would probably get my ass kicked as he was six foot two and much heavier than me. I would at least have gotten in the first sucker punch. Maybe that would have sufficed. However, a fight was not in the plan. Jim spoke. Loren, we should start through security now. Nice to see you again, Jeff. I'll take good care of Loren while she is gone. I stood there and looked at him long and hard. Loren's face blanched. She recovered quickly. Jeff, Jim means that nothing bad will happen to me while I am gone. I turned to Loren and said darkly, I know what he means, Loren. I smiled at Beckman saying, thanks for looking out for her. Thinking I was fooled. Their faces brightened and they turned to go through the security gate. Beckman went through the gate first and started to walk down the roped-off area. Loren was about to hand her driver's license to the large black female TSA agent when I caught her arm and pulled her back to me. You're leaving and not saying goodbye to your husband? I asked. Loren looked at me sheepishly and, giving me a hug and a kiss, replied, Of course, how thoughtless of me. I hugged her close to me saying, I need to talk to you before you leave. We've never been apart for this long before. I want you to know that I love you and have since I was 16 years old. Loren smiled at me and was about to speak when I began again. You're leaving on a plane and I will be driving home alone. Anything could happen to us. If for some reason you should never see me again, I want you to know that you are the best thing that has ever happened to me and I love you more each day. If anything ever happened to you, I could not go on. I kissed and hugged her saying, I love you. Have a good trip and come home to me safely. Loren spoke. I love you too, honey. I have to go now. As she started to leave me, I grabbed her arm and pulled her back to me. I had to try one more time to ask her not to go. She had a look of surprise on her face as I turned her to look at my face. Loren, I know I told you it was all right for you to go. I meant it when I said it. Now that you are leaving, I find that I don't want you to go. It is still not too late. Tell Jim you can't go and come home with me. Blame it all on me. What do you think? Jeff, you know that I can't back out on Mr. Beckman at this late date. The tickets are bought and paid for. Besides, he needs me at this seminar. I know I'm being selfish. I don't want you to go. I need you too. Jeff, I have to go. Don't try to stop me. My mind is made up. I'm going on this trip. I will be a great help to Jim. I can't let him down. She looked in my eyes again, almost spoke, and then thought better of it. She turned, walked to the gate, and gave the agent her license. My eyes missed it up, as I knew she was lying. I am sure Loren thought it was because she was leaving and I would miss her. I walked down the roped-off area to where Beckman was waiting. I watched Loren as she spoke with the TSA agent for a few moments. When she started walking to us, I could see she was flustered. I wondered what they talked about that upset her. She recovered her composure by the time she reached where we were standing. They walked to the machines to get their belongings x-rayed. I watched Loren take off her shoes and place them in the plastic bin. She turned to me and shrugged her shoulders in a what-can-you-do gesture. She then turned to walk through the body scanner. By that time, I had reached the limit of my endurance and quickly walked out of the building. I was no longer angry, just resigned to the fact that Lorin was no longer mine. 
I was becoming accustomed to the fact that we would soon be apart. I moved my car from short-term to long-term, retrieved my carry-on, and went back to the terminal. I waited until the departure board showed that Lauren's plane had left and went through security myself. I sat down to eat breakfast and wait for my flight. I arrived at the hotel by cab and checked in with no problems. The on-site barber was open. I had him shave my face and give me a very short crew cut. Once in my room, I dyed my hair black. When I was done, I looked in the mirror and thought even my mom would not recognize me. With my sunglasses and ball cap on, I could walk through the hotel secure in the knowledge neither Beckman nor Lorin would know it was me. The hotel itself was interesting. It was built like AU. The middle of the U faced Ocean Avenue. Across Ocean Avenue is Lummis Park and then the Atlantic Ocean. Lorraine and Jim's room was in the right arm of the U on the third floor. My room was in the center of the U, room 541 with a great view of the ocean. In addition to the check-in area, the first floor held shops and boutiques. In the middle of the U on the second floor was an outdoor pool. It ran the length of the arms of the U with Shay's lounges placed around the pool. Towel and drink service were available. From the balcony of the room, I had a view of the whole pool area. Across the street is an entrance to the park's boardwalk. The view of the ocean was magnificent. Under different circumstances, this would be a romantic setting. This time it felt anything but romantic. I made the obligatory phone call to Lorraine around 8 o'clock. She picked up with, Hi honey, I'm glad you called. I rang the house a few times and you didn't answer the phone. I was worried about you. Where were you? She inquired. I stopped at one of the local bars with the guys from work. They have been raving about a club and talked me into going. That's all. I replied. She had the nerve to say, you better not be hitting on any girls there, Jeff. Remember, you're a married man. I don't think I could forgive you if you did. The ball's on this which I thought. She's here to continue her affair with Beckman, and she then warns me not to start one of my own. Why do you think I would cheat on you? Have I ever given you any reason to suspect me of betraying you or our marriage? You know me better than that. I could never hurt you by doing something as dirty as that. I laid it on thick now. I know you would never do anything like that to me. That's why I let you to go on this trip to Florida. I trust you completely. I trust you with my heart, even my life. You know that. You do, don't you? I asked. Of course, honey, I feel the same way too. I don't know why I said that. I know you won't do something like that to me, she stammered. Listen, Jeff, I am really tired from the flight. I think it is making me sleepy. Will you call tomorrow and I'll be in a better mood, okay? Sure, Lorraine. We can talk tomorrow, I replied. Good night, Jeff. I love you. Lorraine added. Suddenly tired of the verbal sparring, I simply said, Good night, Lorraine, and hung up the phone. Did she catch me not saying I love her too? Would she even care, I thought? I spent a restless night in bed. Sleep would not come easily. My mind could only imagine what was going on in room 314. I awoke Saturday morning at the crack of dawn. Awoke is the wrong word as I was already awake and watched the sun rise out of the Atlantic Ocean. My plan was to follow the cheaters around the hotel as it turned out my room was all I needed. After a breakfast in my room of scrambled eggs and pancakes, I spent some time on the balcony. I was sitting in a chair enjoying the sun when out of the corner of my eye I saw Lorraine walking to the pool with the a-hole. As I snuck into my room an idea came to me. There are two large fake plants and flower pots in the room. If placed on the balcony, I could watch the pool area without being seen. Careful not to make any noise, I moved both plants to the balcony and placed a chair behind them. I then went inside to retrieve my camera and tripod and placed it so the lens of the camera protruded through the fake foliage. I was sure the lens would not be noticed. By this time, Lorraine and Beckman were already on chaises and talking. Lorraine was sitting facing the arm of the U that contained their room. Lorraine was closest to me and Beckman was on the other side. I realized that Lorraine had done some shopping for this trip. She was wearing a red bikini with a skimpy top that showed off her cleavage. The bottom was cut so high I was sure half her bottom would be on display when she stood up. I turned the camera on and zoomed in on the cheating couple. I soon realized there was a flaw in my plan. I could not hear what they were talking about. I needed to know what they were saying. I had an idea and would tend to it later. I waited for a half hour before I caught the first evidence of infidelity. Beckman, bless his horny heart, leaned over turning Lauren's head with his hand and kissed her on the lips. Lorraine returned the kiss placing her hand on the back of his neck pulling him into her lips. The kiss lasted a few seconds then he leaned back into his chair. Over the next hour I saw three more kisses before they stood up to leave. I saw I was right. Half of Lauren's delectable but was on display for all to see. Worse, they strolled off holding hands. Anyone could see they were a couple. 
As they walked off, I turned off the camera. Retreating to my room, I fell on the bed. A lonely tear fell from my eye. Sadness overcame me and I was very tired. Seeing Lawrence cheating was much worse than suspecting it. The feeling went away quickly. I took out my laptop and did a Google search for spy stores in the South Beach area. Luckily enough, there was one on Collins Avenue, within walking distance of the hotel. Donning my disguise and with a brisk walk, I was soon back in my hotel room with just the thing I needed, another tripod and a top-of-the-line parabolic microphone. It had the capability to plug into my camera, allowing me to add audio to the video I was taking. The microphone was placed on the new tripod next to the camera. Next time, I would be able to hear what they were talking about. Waking up Sunday morning gave me a start. It was bright and sunny out. I had been exhausted, getting very little sleep on Friday night. After dinner Saturday night, I fell asleep and slept the whole night through. A look at my watch told me it was 10 a.m. Lorraine and Beckman could have left the hotel already and this could be a wasted day. I went into the bathroom and did my morning ablutions. Getting dressed, I stepped out onto the balcony when I saw Lorraine and Beckman walking out of Lummis Park. I turned on my camera and mic and then made a phone call to Lorraine. I was listening to what the camera was recording. I could hear Lauren's phone ringing. The parabolic microphone was working as I hoped it would. I could see Lauren look at the phone when Beckman said, Who is it? It's Doofus. Lauren replied with a laugh. Beckman laughed too. Suddenly a worried Lauren said, I should take this. Something bad could have happened. Why else would he call on a Sunday morning? She answered the phone. Jeff, is everything all right? Has something happened? She asked. I had an urge to say, No Doofus is fine, but held my anger in check. I replied instead, nothing's wrong, honey. I was lonely and just wanted to hear your voice. It's nice to know that you're worried about me. I worry about you all the time, Jeff. It is Sunday morning and I thought something bad might have happened. You scared the shit out of me, barked an annoyed Loren. I was getting fed up with Lauren's attitude and told her, I didn't know I would be such a bother you, Loren. I was feeling lonely. I thought that speaking to my wife would cheer me up. Sorry to bother you. She started to answer, but I hung up the phone before she could get the thought out. It's no bother, she said into a dead phone. I could hear her talking into the dead phone over the parabolic mic. She turned her phone off and walked to a nearby bench. What did he want? Beckman asked. He was lonely and wanted to talk to me. Why did I snap at him like that? Loren asked herself more than Beckman. Beckman gave his opinion anyway. Loren, we have been having this affair for six months now. Maybe you are getting tired of him. It might be time to let him go, you know, get a divorce. Then we could spend more time together. We won't have to sneak around anymore, he suggested. Right? She snapped. Your wife won't mind if we go to your house for a matinee, would she? Yeah, she said derisively, we won't have to sneak around anymore. Loren smirked. Jim, you make $38,000 a year. You have no prospects of doing better. After Jeff's last promotion, with his year-end bonus, he makes almost two hundred grand a year. I like you, Jim. The sex is incredible, but you're not that good. Jeff is not bad in that department, so I will really not miss out too much. But someday he is going to be the CEO of that bank and I intend to be there to share it with him. So there will be no divorce. Get that idea out of your head. Besides, you will never get a divorce from Jane. You will never leave your two kids either. So stop bothering me about a divorce. You're right. Beckman replied almost sheepishly, but that doesn't mean we can't enjoy each other's company while we are here, right? Right, stud. My wife smiled, taking his hand in hers. She dragged him across the street and walked out of sight. Six months, I thought. Screwing for six months. She was only staying with me for the money I might make. I could work my bum off for us, and she would have her boyfriends, and I would get her leftovers. I could not get the callous remarks out of my head. That was not going to happen. Not if I could help it. I wondered if I had enough. Enough to get divorced on my terms. I thought I needed more. I was determined to get it. Lorraine and Beckman were more than willing to help me get the evidence I needed. They did not know it at the time. At two o'clock, I noticed Lorraine walking to the pool again wearing a tangerine-colored cover-up. Beckman was right behind her. I quickly turned the camera and microphone on and swiveled the camera until they were in the viewfinder. Beckman sat down while Lauren remained standing with her back to him. She turned and took off the cover-up. I was shocked, and I am sure Beckman was too. Lorraine had no top on. Beckman stared while Lorraine laughed and asked, you like. I like. Beckman replied admiring my wife's body. She was wearing or almost wearing the tiniest tangerine colored bikini bottoms. Loren sensually sat down next to Beckman saying, the girls need some suntan lotion. Would you be a dear and help me out? She handed Beckman a bottle of lotion. 
He took the bottle and poured a liberal amount of lotion on her body and started massaging it into her skin. I couldn't believe my good luck to get this on video. Lorraine turned over on her back again and asked Beckman, are you going to lie back and get some sun too? At this point, one of the hotel employees approached saying, Miss, some guests have been complaining about your display of nudity at the pool. Such displays are not allowed on the hotel premises. I must insist that you cover up. Sheepishly, Lorraine looked around and grabbed her cover up and put it on. They had to wait for Beckman's Johnny to go down before they could retreat to the safety of their room. I checked the camera to make sure it had recorded the action. It had. I felt I almost had enough. If I could only get them in action, I would be done. I made no phone call to Loren that Sunday night. I had called earlier. I felt like I had been rebuffed. Then again, Loren did not call me either. Monday morning, I awoke at 9 a.m. I ordered breakfast in as usual. I thought I would spy from my vantage point on the balcony and see what I could capture with my new camera. It wasn't until 6 p.m. that I saw anything interesting. The doors to their room slid open and Beckman stepped out onto the balcony. He was wearing one of the complimentary heavy cotton robes supplied by the hotel. The robe was tied in the front and he was leaning with both hands on the railing looking out over the pool. I aimed my video and audio aids at the balcony and started recording when Lorin came out wearing a similar bathrobe. She came up behind him, giving Beckman a hug saying, Do you think you can get the big guy up for another round stud? I may need another 30 minutes or so. You've worn me out, he laughed. They started making out right there. This was the piece of compromising evidence I would need to prove adultery. It would not make any difference in court, but might make a difference to Lauren's mom and dad, maybe to friends and other relatives as well. All this video was shot in public and would be admissible in any court. After watching the scene on the hotel balcony, I knew my marriage was over. The balcony video was now proof positive she was cheating. Maybe I should say more proof. She actually admitted it on the Sunday morning phone call. Hearing about it was hard, but seeing it was unbearable. I decided I had enough. I would be leaving tomorrow. I used my phone to confirm a flight leaving tomorrow at 3. Luckily, there were a few single seats available. It was now one half hour since I saw Lorraine pull him back inside the room. I wondered if they had done it already. I wondered if they might still be doing it. I decided this might be a good time to make my nightly phone call to my loving wife. I hoped it would be a distraction at just the right time. I dialed Lauren's cell. She picked up on the fifth ring. What a surprise. She seemed out of breath. Hello, she mumbled. Loren. I asked with concern in my voice. Are you okay? It took a long time for you to pick up the phone, and you seem out of breath. I had to give it to her. Loren was a nimble liar when she replied. I was in the shower when I heard the phone ring. I grabbed a towel and ran to answer the phone. You should see me right now. I think you'd get some naughty ideas. I am sure I would, babe. I am calling to see how your day was. Did you have a productive time at the seminar? Oh, she said haltingly. Yes, Jeff, we had a good day at the seminar. I heard something in her reply. It was in her voice. It took me by surprise. I had never turned down a little phone sex with Loren. It was never really phone sex. Just some titillating talk over the phone. Still, I had never turned it down before. This was a first. Yes, that's what was in her voice. Surprise with shock and disappointment thrown in. She continued. How was your day, honey? I feel down. Kind of sorry for myself. I miss your sweet voice. I miss giving you a hug and getting a kiss in return. Most of all, I miss you lying in bed next to me at night. That bed gets big and lonely when you are not here to share it with me. But I don't have to tell you that. You're experiencing the same thing. You know what it is like waking up alone in the morning. You're spending your nights alone, aren't you, Loren? There, I finally threw it out there. I was wondering what she would say. All I heard was some muffled talking. Loren, are you there? I asked. You were sleeping alone, right? Then she was back. Right, honey, that's right, she lied. Listen, Jeff, I'm freezing here, and I'm all wet. I have to go now. I will talk to you tomorrow. Okay. I didn't answer. I love you, she said. I responded, right? Goodbye, Loren. I hung up the phone. I packed the tripods and microphone. Next, I packed what little clothes I had with me. It had been a while since I had eaten. I put on my disguise and went down to the hotel restaurant to eat. I took the camera with me to review today's footage. As I was taken to a table by the hostess, I saw Lorin and Beckman sitting in a booth. I walked right by them and was seated two tables away out and a little behind them. I was at Lauren's back, facing Beckman. I was able to snap a couple of photos without them noticing. When the waitress came with my food, I did see Lorin look my way, but she showed no concern. She obviously did not recognize me. 
I must have looked like any other tourist reviewing the day's photos on the camera. I quietly ate my meal, sneaking a peek at the two lovebirds. I did notice Lorin look my way one more time, but there was no recognition on her face. I finished eating and left first with them still sitting in the booth. Once again, sleep was hard to come by. I was up and sitting on the balcony at 7 the next morning. I'd moved the plants back inside the room. I no longer cared if they saw me. I had the evidence I wanted. Not that I actually wanted to find any. I had wanted to find no evidence. I was saddened that I had proof that Lorin was cheating. I was looking at the sunrise when I saw a white van with the blue feb lettering on it. Pull up at 7.15. Lorin and Beckman got into the van and it drove off. I'll be damned, I thought. They actually were doing some work this week. I had two things left to do this morning. First, I accessed one of the two computers the hotel provided for the guests. I printed two pictures that I took since I got down here. Then I went to the check-in desk and inquired who would be working the desk on Saturday morning. I found out it was a young man named Carlos. We had a chat, and I slipped him $200. If all went well, Lorin and Beckman would have a little surprise when they checked out Saturday morning. I checked out and flew back to New York to take care of things back home. Let's now look at the events at the hotel from Lauren's point of view. Tuesday morning saw Jim and me up early and off the first day of our seminars. When we returned that evening, we were both too tired to engage in any amorous pursuits. Jim actually fell asleep early while I waited up for a call from Jeff. By 10 o'clock, I was furious with him for not calling again. By 11 o'clock, the fear crept back into my mind. Did he know and was not calling on purpose? Should I call him? No, it was too late. I thought about what Jim said yesterday and had to agree. Jeff knew nothing. If I really believed that, why did it take so long to fall asleep that night? Wednesday was the same as Tuesday. We both dragged ourselves back to the hotel room and ordered dinner in. After eating and a quick shower, Jim was refreshed and wanted sex. I was a wreck. I couldn't think of anything except waiting for Jeff's phone call. When it didn't come, I was terrified. There was no way he would not call two nights in a row. Even Jim was beginning to become concerned. Jim's wife had called him every day. Now he was beginning to wonder. When I did not receive a phone call by 9 o'clock on Thursday, I called my mom and explained to her that I had not heard from Jeff since Monday and would she go to the house and check up on Jeff. My mom said of course and would go right over there. 30 minutes later my cell rang and it was from our home phone. I picked it up blurting, Jeff I am so glad you finally called. Are you okay? It's me Loren, mom replied. Jeff is not here. I looked through all the rooms in the house. He is not lying unconscious in any of them. All his clothes are in the closets and the computer is in the office. Would you mind telling me what is going on? Nothing is going on, Mom. I lied. We had a little argument on the phone and I guess Jeff is mad at me. I'm sure it will be all right when I finally talk to him. I am relieved to know he is not lying unconscious in one of the rooms like you said. If you hear from him, please ask him to call me. I will, Loren. This is so unlike him. You must have said or done something really bad for him not to call you for three days. No, Mom. Nothing that bad. Just have him call if you see him. Thanks for doing this for me. I'll see you when I get home. Bye, Mom. Well, all right, honey. I miss you and can't wait to see you on Saturday. Good night, Loren. After the phone call from my mom, I was even more worried. Where in the hell could he be? Why wasn't he at home? I realized I would have to wait two more days to find out unless he called or I could get a hold of him. I decided to call myself, the home line, and his cell. I got voicemail on both lines. I left beseeching messages on both lines, telling him how much I missed him and couldn't wait to speak with him. I also said if he was mad at me for any reason we could work it out when I got home, and please don't do anything rash. I was beginning to believe that my marriage might be over. Friday seemed to drag on forever. I was unsurprised not to get a phone call that night. I did call my home phone and Jeff's cell phone, but did not get a return call. Needless to say, a sullen Jim did not get any sex that night either. I was up early Saturday morning. I was packed and dressed before Jim even got up. It was about 11 o'clock when we left the room to check out. When the elevator door opened up to the lobby, I looked across to the checkout desk and saw the attendant pick up his phone and make a phone call. He spoke for a few seconds and hung up as we approached the front of the desk. Jim gave the clerk our key cards and his credit card. The badge on the clerk's shirt indicated his name was Carlos. Carlos gave Jim the credit card back and had him sign some papers. What he said next caused my brain to turn to mush. He ambushed us when he said, Mr. Beckman, Mrs. Carlson, I hope you enjoyed your stay here at the Victor and hope to see you back again soon. When I heard him say my real name, my mind went blank. All I could do was look back to him and say, what did you call me? 
You are Mrs. Carlson, aren't you? He asked with a sly smile. My smart answer was, why do you think that? He placed two photos on the counter in front of us. One was a photo of Jim sitting in the hotel restaurant. The other was of me obviously taken on the day I tried to sunbathe by the pool topless. Carlos went on to explain how he received the photos. A man was checking out and asked me if I knew the people in the photos. I told him I did. I told him that you were the Beckmans. You were well known here after the display of your naked charms last Monday. The man went on to tell me that I was wrong. He said the man in the photo is in fact Jim Beckman, but the woman with him is not Jim's wife, but my wife Lorraine Carlson. He was here? Jeff was here. When did he get here? I asked. Carlos once again gave me a look I could not understand. Let me take a look. Carlos typed into his computer and informed me, a Mr. Jeff Carlson checked in last Friday at 4 and checked out Tuesday at noon. Oh my God, Jim, he was here the whole weekend. I exclaimed. Carlos turned to me and asked, You are Mrs. Carlson, aren't you? Yes, I am. I shamefully admitted. Good. In that case, I have something for you. Carlos smiled that same enigmatic smile as he handed me an envelope. I looked at it. It was not addressed to anyone. I opened the envelope and took out the folded paper inside. I opened it up and read the three words printed on it. Loren, goodbye, doofus. I felt as if I would faint and leaned up against Jim for support. After he steadied me, he took the paper from my hand and read it. I could see a worried look come over his face as he whispered to me, Come on, Loren, let's get out of here. Before we could leave, Carlos called to Jim. I have an envelope for you as well, Mr. Beckman. He held out his hand with the envelope. Jim stared at it for a long while. I know he did not want to touch it. Finally, Jim took it and pulled out the paper inside and read it. Jim read it and turned to look out the window that faced Ocean Avenue and almost absent-mindedly dropped the paper to the floor. I picked up the paper and read it. Did you think you were going to get off scot-free, a hole? I spent the last two hours this morning with your wife. I don't think you will receive the homecoming you thought you were going to get. I showed her all my evidence. This is only the beginning. I will try my best to make your life a living hell. Jim was still staring out the window. I took the two pictures and the letters of Jim and me. As I was putting them in my purse, I saw Carlos pick up the phone and say, Did you hear it? I stared at him as he continued. Was it all you expected? That's good, sir. I hope to see you at the victor again. You have made your stay a most interesting one. The same to you, sir. Goodbye. Was that my husband? I asked. Carlos once again gave me that smile but said nothing. I told Jim, Let's go. We have a plane to catch. On the way to the airport, I called my mom. I asked her to meet us at JFK Airport. Perplexed, my mom asked, Isn't Jeff picking you up? I don't know, mom. We did have that argument, and I know he is very upset with me right now. I can't believe that, honey. Jeff would never leave you stranded. Lorraine, my mom asked, now with suspicion in her voice, What exactly was your argument about? Nothing, mom. It is nothing for you to worry about. That's bullshit. It must have been something big for him to not pick you up plus the trip to your house to see where he was Thursday night. No phone calls. It had to have been something big. Then with horror in her voice and maybe some realization of what might have gone on, she asked in a loud voice, My God, Loren, what have you done? I started blubbering. I haven't done anything that couldn't be fixed. Mom, please come to the airport in case Jeff doesn't show up. If you've done what I think you've done, he won't be there. Don't worry, I'll pick you up. Then she hung up the phone. I don't remember much about the cab ride to the airport or going through security and boarding the plane. It was as if my mind just shut down and I was operating on autopilot. I did not start to have any lucid thoughts until we were in the air. Once my mind started working again, I pulled out the photos of Jim and me. It was obvious when the picture of me was taken. Jeff had to see what transpired between Jim and me on Monday. I then looked closely at the picture of Jim. He was sitting in a booth and wearing a black shirt. The only time he wore that shirt was on Monday evening at the hotel restaurant. A cold shiver went down my spine. The guy sitting with the Mets ball cap and camera must have been Jim. If he saw everything we did on Monday, I knew a divorce could be in my future. Another thing was bothering me. In Jeff's letter to me, he called himself Doofus. I only called him Doofus once. That was when I answered his phone call on Sunday. Somehow he must have had us wired for sound. I shudder to think what he would do if he heard our whole conversation. I could only hope he would pick me up at JFK to take me home. I thought the odds of that happening weren't good. Jim was sitting in the seat next to the window. Every time I looked at him, he was looking out the window, but I knew he was really seeing nothing. I spent most of the flight home staring at the letters and pictures. I kept going over in my mind the phone calls I received from Jeff. 
If Jeff was in Miami who knows what he saw or heard, the not knowing terrified me. The most disturbing thing was the last phone call. I knew that night that something was wrong. Something was off with that call. His attitude was off and there was something I missed. I now felt it was very important and Jim sticking his tool in my face made me miss it. After running all the events through my mind, I knew I could do nothing until I saw Jeff again. When the flight landed, I couldn't wait to leave the plane. I ran through the terminal until I left the security area. If Jeff was coming to pick me up, I should see him there. There is a small ramp, which leads to the concourse where Jeff should be waiting. I said a quick prayer as I came off the ramp. I saw my mom waiting for me. I asked, is Jeff here? Mom shook her head left to right and said, no. Jim followed right behind me and he looked around and did not see Jane. He looked crestfallen. He quickly took out his phone and made a call to his wife, Jane. It's me. Will you pick me up? He asked. He listened for a while and then ended the call. He looked at us and said, she hung up. She's not coming. He walked to a bench and put his face into his hands. I was sure he was crying. Mom walked to Jim, pulled him by his arm and said to me, let's go. I'll drive you both home. On the drive to my house, mom kept giving me withering looks. Once I turned to look at Jim, he was looking out the window and tears were streaming down his face. Like me, I thought he was thinking this trip was a stupid idea, definitely not worth it. Arriving home, I did not know if Jeff would be there. I asked Jim to wait in the car. A confrontation would not be good at this point, if ever. I ran into the house yelling, I'm home, Jeff. There was no response. Jeff, are you here? I called out again. Silence. I ran through the house looking for Jeff. I went into our bedroom and found his closet and dresser empty. Panicking, I ran past mom standing by the dining room table going straight to Jeff's office. When I looked in the room, I knew I was in trouble. The office was empty. Realizing he was gone, I walked into the living room and heavily sat down. It took only a few moments to appreciate the fact that he had four days to make plans. The removal of his clothes and personal items may be just the beginning. What else had he done? Eventually, I turned to look at my mother. She was standing by the dining room table with an envelope in her hand. Mom handed the papers to me. The writing in Jeff's hand simply said, divorce paperwork. She then handed me a jewel case with a sheet of paper attached. The paper said, if you want to know why, look at the DVD. Mom already had the disc out of the case and walked to the TV. She turned on the TV and the DVD player and slipped the CD into the slot. She took the remote and sat down on the new sectional I had just had to have. Jeff feigned reluctance before giving in quickly and took me out to pick it out. I realized now that he always gave me anything I wanted with very little difficulty. Before mom could start the DVD, Jim opened the door and asked, Is everything all right? No, Jeff is not here. His clothes are gone as well. It looks like he has left me. I am sorry it came to this. I will call a cab and wait outside. I have to get home and try to repair my marriage. I only hope I can, Jim told Loren. I only hope I can he said as he walked out the door. For his children's sake, I hoped he could too. After Jim left, mom started the DVD. I sat down next to mom as the first scene opened. I was appalled to see myself walking to the pool in the small red bikini with Jim following along behind me. I was obvious he was leering at my butt. My mom gave a quick glance my way then turned back to the screen. I tried to take the remote from her hand, but she would not give it up. I watched myself give amorous kisses to Jim and felt ashamed with mom sitting there. Her eyes never left the screen. The next scene opened with Jim and me walking out of Lummis Park. The big difference in this scene is that you could hear us talking. When the phone rang and I called Jeff Doofus, I realized that he heard everything we said that morning. I was trying to remember if I said anything incriminating when I heard Jim say that our affair had been going on for six months. Mom stopped the DVD and put her face in her hands and started crying. I apologized. I'm sorry, Mom. I don't know how I let this happen. She gave me a disgusted look and pressed play again. I listened as I told Jim, right stud. I absolutely revolted myself with that comment. The third scene was of me topless at the pool. My poor mom had to watch me put myself on display and let Jim maul my body and manhandle me in public at the pool. I thought how dismayed she must feel looking at my debauchery. My heart sunk when I thought how mom must have felt watching my wickedness. Next came the scene where I pulled Jim into the room to have sex with him. The next scene was the worst. I finally got to hear what I missed that night on the phone. There was no video, but Jeff must have recorded his side of the conversation. Jeff said, you are spending your nights alone, aren't you Loren? Then I heard muffled talking. That must have been when Jim stuck his tool in my face. Then Jeff asked again, Loren, are you there? You are sleeping alone, right? 
It was said with such venom that if I heard it, I would have known that he knew. Thanks to Jim, I never heard it. All I said was, right, honey, that's right. The next scene showed a hand cover the camera lens, and it became apparent he was taking the camera off a tripod. The image on the screen moved wildly, finally stopping looking out the sliding glass door out onto the balcony. It appeared to be placed on a table. Jeff reappeared and sat on a chair, dismantled the microphone, and started to fold up the tripods, placing them in a black canvas bag. Abruptly, a scream pierced the night. I knew it was the moment that Jim gave me that incredible orgasm. Jeff's head swiveled to look out into the darkness. As his head turned back, I could see the agony on his face. He put his head down and I heard quiet sobs for about five seconds. Then he seemed to pull himself together drying his eyes on the bottom of his t-shirt. Then he spoke out loud to himself, That's the second time she has done this to you, Jeff. It will never happen again. He then stood, walked to the camera and the screen went blank. Mercifully, the show was over. He had skillfully captured my infidelity for all to see. No one was more aghast than my mom who hung her head and cried silent tears. No one was sadder except for me. When I saw Jeff's tears, I was filled with self-loathing. When he said the second time, I was confused. I did not know he had cried over me before. When he said it would never happen again, I was filled with fear. Fear for what I had done to my marriage. Mom asked me, what are you going to do now? Do you want to save your marriage or run off with that guy outside? My God, Mom, I love Jeff. Of course I want to save my marriage. I am not running off with Jim. He has a wife and two children. He will never leave them. Whether he gets to save his marriage will not be his choice to make. It won't be your choice to save your marriage either. That will be up to your husband. If you still have one. He has had many days to make up his mind. You already have divorce paperwork sitting on your dining room table. What other things has he thought to do? If you really want to keep Jeff, you better talk to him soon and give him a good reason to take you back. I wouldn't wait too long. He already has a big head start. I called Jeff's cell number as soon as mom left. He hadn't answered any of my phone calls and I wasn't sure if he would answer now. I knew I had to try. Surprisingly, he answered on the second ring. There was no anger in his voice and chillingly, there was no emotion at all. Loren, what do you want? He asked. Jeff, we need to talk. Will you talk to me? Sure, Loren. When do you want to do this talking? Tomorrow. Anytime you can make it. Okay, Lauren. Tomorrow at two. Goodbye. Short and to the point, I thought. I did not like the lack of emotion I heard or didn't in his voice. He sounded so cold. It was as if he had made up his mind and was not going to change it. He was going to get the confrontation over with as quickly as possible. If I were wearing boots, I would be shaking in them. I realized this would not be easy. The next afternoon, I was looking out the front window when I saw his car pull into the driveway. Instead of coming in the front door, he walked around the side of the house to enter through the rear door. I ran into the kitchen and sat at the table that was set for lunch. Jeff walked through the door, I think surprised to see me sitting there. Hi Jeff, thank you for meeting me today. He nodded his head in reply. He sat at the table, looked at the place setting, and then turned back to me with a questioning look. I thought you might be hungry. I have lunch prepared in the fridge if you want to eat. He shook his head no saying, I have already eaten, and pushed the plate away. He looked at me again, his expression screamed at me. You wanted to talk, so talk. I began, Jeff I want to tell. No, I need to tell you how sorry I am. It looked like Jeff was going to say something in reply, but I cut him off. I know what you are going to say. Sorry for getting caught or sorry for cheating. By the look on his face, I knew I was correct. Yes, I am sorry I was caught, but not for the reason you might think. I am sorry that I ever started cheating in the first place. The thing that bothers me the most about it is the pain and hurt I see on your face caused by my foolish actions. Knowing that I caused that is tearing me apart inside. Can you forgive me, Jeff? Even if you do, I don't know if I could ever forgive myself. I waited for Jeff to speak it. He said nothing. I could see pain, anger, confusion, and even love flash across his face while I waited for a response. When he finally spoke, I was surprised at what he said. Do you know that when I woke up in the morning, I would lay in bed and watch you sleep? Or after I would finish my shower, I would sit on the chair next to the bed and watch you. I knew he did. I caught him a few times. On occasion, I would open one eye and say, what? He would smile and laugh quietly coming to me and giving me a kiss on the forehead. You looked so peaceful, lying there, even beautiful, at least to me. I would gaze at your face, looking at your eyes, every curve of your face, the way your nostrils would flare, the way your mouth would open slightly, as if you were dreaming, maybe about me. Now I think maybe about him. I thought how lucky I was, having you in my life. My guardian angel sent you to me, to give color and brighten my otherwise drab existence. You've taken that away from me. 
the color and light are gone. Now, since Wednesday, when I wake up in the morning, I still smile to myself and think how lucky I am to have you, how much love I have for you, until I roll over to look for you, and you are not there. Then I remember. I remember what you did and the pain and hurt returns. That has happened every morning since. The only difference is that every morning I love you a little less and the pain is not as bad. I realized that my mom was right. I waited too long. Maybe if I got home on Wednesday night I could have talked to him and maybe made a difference. It seems that now I am too late. He has run what happened in his mind and the choice he made is to divorce, the last thing I want. Please Jeff, don't make a hasty choice. I know I've been a shit and I don't deserve any consideration but I beg of you give me a chance to make it up to you. Give me a chance to show you I can be the wife you deserve. Please give me a second chance. I looked at him awaiting his answer. I saw his eyes tear up, then a tear run down his cheek. I reached over to his face and wiped the tear away with my thumb. I swore you wouldn't make me cry again. Now look at me, he commented sadly. Jeff, I heard you say on the DVD this was the second time you cried over me. When was the first time? Loren, I fell in love with you when you got out of your dad's car the first time I laid eyes on you. My best memories are of that summer we spent together. My worst memory is when you deserted me at the harvest dance. You tricked me and dumped me for another guy, just like this time. You left me to be ridiculed by Billy Barber and the rest of the football team. I don't know how many nights I cried at night in my bed where no one could see me. So you see the Monday night was the second time I cried over you. The tear that just fell is, I guess, the third time. I'm sorry, Jeff. I seem to be saying that a lot today. This will sound foolish to you, but it was just sex. Foolish, illicit sex. He's gone and I could care less. I will never see him again and I won't miss him at all. All I need is you by my side. I don't know, Loren. I saw you do things in public. You went topless for him. You let him put his hands all over you at the pool. What he said next sent shivers through my body. He shook his head sadly and said, I heard the scream. I know I can't compete with that. I won't compete with another man. I won't compete with the memory of that other man for my wife. If we stay together, I will always be competing with his ghost, trying to match your other man. You won't have to compete with anybody. You will never understand unless it happens to you. Again, Jeff sadly shook his head and began to rise from his seat. I thought he was about to leave. I saw my marriage going up in smoke. I don't know what possessed me. I leapt out of my chair knocking it over, ran to Jeff and gave him a bare hug that I would not let go of. All the while I was babbling, don't go, Jeff. Please don't leave me now. When I saw your letter at the hotel, I realized what I was doing. I found out that you and my marriage are what are important. Please forgive me and take me back. He put his arms loosely around me and gently stroked my hair. After a while, he placed his hands on my shoulders and gently moved me back from him, so he could look into my eyes as he spoke to me. Whenever I thought of us in the future, I saw the two of us together. A house surrounded by a white picket fence, just like in the movies. We would have two sons and a girl like you for me to spoil. She would have me wrapped around her finger, just like her mother did. I saw us planning weddings, celebrating anniversaries and special birthdays. I saw us growing old together, our love supporting us through the hard times. Now I see nothing. I have a big black hole where there used to be love. I see the numbing darkness of a life without you. He backed away saying, I have to go. I have something to do. Don't go, we have so much to discuss. No, I have to write a thank you letter. What letter could be more important than trying to repair our marriage? And who do you need to write a letter to? Ronnie Millsap. Why? What does he have to do with this? He helped me to dump a cheating wife. He turned and walked out the door whistling a tune I later learned was a stranger in my house. Five years later, my wife asked me to pull the car around to the front of the house. We were going to my folks for a Memorial Day cookout. I walked out the back door past the newly built tin car garage to the cliff overlooking the beach below across the Long Island Sound to the shore of Connecticut. I no longer lived in the rented house in Nassau Shores but in the old town of Muttontown. Turning back to the garage, I had to decide what car I wanted to take to my parents' home. My eyes settled on garage number five. I clicked the remote and stood by while the door went up to reveal my newest acquisition. I closed the door, started the engine. I loved the sound of the powerful rebuilt 390 V8 Ford engine. As the car cleared the garage, I lowered the convertible top and pulled around to the circular drive in front of the house. I got out and turned to look at the latest object of my affection. A 1961 Ford Thunderbird convertible with gleaming chrome, black paint, interior and roof. God, she was beautiful. My wife opened the door and made a frown. The baby and I cannot drive with the top down you have to put it up. 
I sighed and told Nina, Okay, I'll put it up, but it looks so much cooler with the top down. If you ever want me to be in it with my top down again, you better put it up now. My mind went back to that day when I first got the car and we went out driving with the top down and Nina pulled her top down and I quickly hit the button to put it up. Nina smugly smiled. She knew how to use her prodigious sexual power. I met Nina two months before the divorce to Lorraine was final. The one thing that Mr. Diamond the bank president agreed on with his ex-wife was their adopted child from Romania. While they hated each other, they both loved that little girl. The Diamonds ran a charity to help the plight of Romanian orphans. I knew I was expected to attend the $1,000 per plate fundraiser. As I had become a favorite of Mr. Diamond, I was seated at his table next to his wife. There was an empty seat next to me. Before I sat down, I looked at the card on the table. It said, Reserved for I, Kiranova. As I sat down, I nodded my hello to Mr. Diamond and placed a small kiss on the cheek of the ex-Mrs. Diamond. I took a second glance at my boss because he had this mischievous smile on his face. It seemed like only seconds before this beauty in black sat down in the seat next to me. Mr. Diamond's face beamed and his smile never faded as he introduced me to Ianina, pronounced Ianina, Kiranova, a Victoria's Secret lingerie model. I later found that Nina was herself a Romanian orphan and a member of the board that ran the charity. Nina and I hit it off that night. We talked about our lives. She told me about her horrific life in the Romanian orphanages. I think she had me almost in tears. I wanted to hold her and protect her. She told me later that she could feel the empathy from me and it made her want to find out more about me. She was asked to dance by many of the unattached men at the affair, but she turned them all down. I did not ask her as I thought she did not want to dance. Nina took the matter in her own hands and asked me to dance. I said yes, of course. We dated for two years before getting married. The wedding was held at Mr. Diamond's estate in Southampton, New York. I thought his wife was a little young for him at 35 to 61, but he always had a smile on his face, so what do I know? We had a great first year when Nina came to me and said she wanted to have a baby. I asked her if she realized having a baby would put her modeling career on hold for a long time. She looked straight in my eyes and informed me that, the one thing I want most in this world is to have your baby. A big smile crossed her face as she said, maybe more than one. I'm sure a big smile crossed my face and I suggested, I think we should start trying right away. We both laughed and ran to the bedroom. A year and a half later, our son Jeff Jr. was born. We got in the car after settling Jeff Jr. in the car seat in the rear of the car. The only non-stock part of the T-Bird was the air conditioner I had installed. I knew from experience, once Nina get all dressed up, she wants nothing to spoil her hair. She would rather ride in 100 degree heat than get one hair out of place. Getting the AC installed would make it more pleasurable for the both of us. As we walked into my dad's backyard where he was barbecuing burgers and dogs, I was shocked to see Lorraine and her mom Cheryl sitting at the table talking to my mom. Nina was carrying Jeff Jr. and walked to the table and sat down. Mom quickly took her favorite and only grandson from Nina. I went to dad and asked, what the hell are they doing here? My dad said, keep your voice down. Your mom invited them. She and Cheryl have become close since Frank died. Lorraine was all alone, so your mother invited her also. You know, she had a hard time getting rid of that a-hole Billy Barber after you two got divorced. I knew she married Billy after I met Nina. I didn't think she was that stupid. Well, she did cheat on me with the a-hole Beckman. I thought for sure that he would have gotten divorced. Instead, his wife took him back. She did have two kids to worry about. That must make a difference. For a long time, I hired a PI to keep track of him. Every time he got near getting a good job, I had the word put out that he was a bad employee and he lost out. It went on until he or his wife figured out that I must have a hand in his string of bad luck. Jane Beckman called and straight out asked me if Jim's bad luck at getting a job had anything to do with payback from me. Before I could answer, she told me that it not only hurt Jim but herself and her two kids. She went on to say that she thought it was horrible what he did to me but don't take it out on her children. I didn't come right out and tell her I was involved, but did say that I was sure he would have an easier time getting a job from now on. She thanked me profusely and apologized for him screwing up my marriage. I have no idea what he is doing now as I let the PI go along with all the remaining hate I had for him. Actually, it was a big relief to get rid of the baggage I was carrying. I took my son from Nina and said hello to Lorraine and Cheryl then walking over to a bench by the rear door to the kitchen. A few moments later, Cheryl Schiavo sat down next to me and reached out her arms to hold Jeff Jr. We sat quietly as she played with my eight-month-old son. Finally, she looked at me with tears in her eyes and lamented, he should have been my grandson. I would have made the best grandma. You know that, don't you, Jeff? 
I looked closely at Cheryl Schiavo. She had aged over the last five years. I knew our divorce had been hard on her. She always liked me and was thrilled when Lorraine and I had gotten married. I know you would have mom. You were a great mom to Lorraine, and I know you would have been the best grandma too. Thank you, Jeff. I have missed you the last five years. Oh, and congratulations on your promotion at the bank. Your dad tells me that you are in the number two position there now. Yes, Mr. Diamond finally retired with a little pressure from the board of directors. They moved Howard Goldman to the top spot, and he took me along with him to the executive vice president in charge of operations. Basically, if I keep my nose clean when Howard leaves, I should move up to the president's position. Jeff, Loren wanted to talk to you, but was afraid to come over. Can I tell her it's okay? Sure, mom. I replied. It's been five years. I am sure we can talk civilly together. Lauren's mom went back to the table and spoke to her. Before she could get up, Nina came to me and said, Be gentle with her, Jeff. She is very fragile. Don't upset her. I nodded my assent. Nina walked away as Loren walked up. Hi, Jeff. You're looking good. Hi, Loren. You do too. Nina is beautiful, Jeff, inside and out, and a good person, I can tell. Thank you. I have been lucky to have two beautiful wives. That's not true. I may have been attractive outside, but inside, not so much. That's not true. You are beautiful inside and out. You got blinded by Jim Beckman. I'm sure it was something I did to run you away. Now that's really not true. Do you remember what I did at the dance with Billy Barber? What did you do there? No, it was me. There's something inside me that screws all the good things up. Something that's not so pretty. Let's change the subject. Mom tells me that you received another promotion at work. I always knew you would rise to the top. Well, good things have happened to me in the last five years. I looked at Nina and smiled. When I turned back to Lorraine, I saw she looked at Nina also. She turned to me and smiled also. Jeff, there is one thing I need to clear up from that time five years ago. I hadn't wanted to go there, but she brought it up. It was the telephone conversation where I called you doofus. I want you to know that was the first time I ever called you that. To this day, I don't know why I did it. That's not why I brought that day up. It is what I said to Jim about you that day. I told him that you would be president of the bank and about how much money you made. I realized it sounded like I only wanted to be with you for the money. That's not what I meant at all. I knew you would be a success. I was always so proud of you. I just wanted to be there when you accomplished your goal. That's what I wanted to share with you. It was never about the money. Please believe it was not about money. When I first heard it, I was sure it was about the money. It wasn't until I let Nina hear what you said. She is the one that suggested that I did not have it right. She thought that from the look on your face that you were not putting me down but bragging about me to Jim. It made me feel so much better about you. I think I started to forgive then. There is one more thing I need to thank you for. What's that? What you did for Jane Beckman. She called me crying about what you had been doing to Jim. She asked me to call you, but I told her it would be better coming from her. I gave her your number at the bank. She called to tell me that Jim had finally gotten a job that could support them. She wanted me to thank you for her. I'm glad it turned out well. I never thought about her or the children. I am glad it's over. I stood up and hugged Lorraine. As we walked to the table, Lorraine was crying happy tears and Nina was beaming happily at me. We sat at the table and had an enjoyable day. On the ride home that night, we had the convertible top up, but Nina had her top down. It turned out to be another wonderful day. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.